o'clock, we will call to order the regular Board of Education meeting tonight on October 26th at 6 p.m. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. is on her way up, so it should be right here. So I think Sylvia can surely start. Right. Mm -hmm. Sounds great. Hello, board members. I'm Sylvia Green, a current senior at North High School this year. This is such a treat to be in person. I've been sitting in my bedroom the past year, so this is super nice. Um, for those of you who do not know me, I am one of three children in my family. I have an older sister, Madeline, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a younger brother, Gatehoon, at Urban Middle School, who's in seventh grade. I'm super grateful for the opportunity to speak to you a little bit about how the past two months at North have looked. And please feel free to interrupt me with any questions or comments. Um, starting with some of the academics, being back to school has been awesome. Just face to face is so refreshing and being able to build those connections with my teachers and um, just being able to trust each other and go to them for help um, and vice versa. Um, looking at this year compared to last year, one of the biggest differences I've noticed was masking. I would say in the beginning of the school year, roughly 30% of the student body was masked, and now I would say roughly 10 to 15% are masked. And for teachers, I would say it's stayed pretty consistent around 50%. Um, being in the classroom five days a week has been a major positive for me. Um, it's just another day of organization, and now what Wednesdays are actually really set for um, parent-student activity contact time as well as clubs. As um, president of student council, we really are trying to generate that school spirit on Wednesday. So after school, we'll be like, hey, come join student council, see what's going on, and that kind of fun stuff. So um, student and extracurricular engagement is also so much higher than last year. So many students are wanting to get involved, which is great. And then finally, off-campus lunch and Raider time is back in action, which allows for students to have a lot more independence, which I think is great. They can kind of choose and pick where they want to spend their time, if it means going to a teacher they need to find help, or even just at lunch getting out of the school for like half an hour makes a big difference. Um, looking at some of the sports and clubs at North High, um, things have opened up a lot. Um, as a student who's very involved, um, I've just fuel off of being back in school and having all these clubs up and running. I'm part of the dance program, track, student council, Delta, Blue Crew, and Expo, just to name a few of them. And I'm super engaged and love the school spirit. Um, participation at events is through the roof this year. At our North-South homecoming football game, we had roughly 800 students there, which is the most I've ever seen in the past. So that includes like the students playing football, the dancers, cheers, uh, band members, and then just the student section. And out of all my four years so far, I can say this is by far the largest number of students we've had. And then at our homecoming dance, we had about 1,000 students there. So for student council, we raised a ton of money, which we're super excited to give back to the school and community. Um, another exciting new change um, to North High is our new Start Change Club. So, Chris, I know you've been actually very involved <laughs> in the club. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, is it We Rise? Yep. Yeah, so it's very similar to that. And um, I reached out to the advisor this week to kind of get a little bit more information on what the club is about. And she shared that their goal is to kind of evaluate uh, student voices in the name of equity, justice, and inclusion. Um, um, just to kind of help improve the community at North High. Um, they see their goal attainable through research-based discussions and um, implement to create presentations and panel discussions just to kind of educate the staff, students, and even the community. Um, right now they have approximately 20 students in their club, but they're looking to expand this. Sometimes during Raider time they'll offer a session where they'll get maybe 25 to 30 students. So 
people are kind of just testing the waters with the club and hopefully it's something that can just grow over time. So then looking at school-wide events, last week North opened up its COVID testing site for <laughs> students and staff. Um, and this week we actually opened it up to the community. Um, on Thursday, October 28th, so this week Thursday, we will be hosting a community volunteer fair called All Hands on Deck. So over 40 organizations from around Sheboygan will be hands-on discussions for volunteerism with students um, and community members. And talking to a, a friend at school, she was like, I wanted to sign up, but they're actually so full already. So that's exciting because a lot of students are interested in this and we need volunteers all over the community right now. And then on Monday, November 8th and Tuesday, November 9th, all sophomores will be presenting or participating in the Respect Retreat put on by the Youth Frontiers organization. And then the freshmen will be doing this in the spring. I did this as a freshman and it was a super neat experience. We kind of got to know our grade level a little bit more, which especially is important for freshmen and sophomores who haven't had that exposure to other students in their grade. And it just kind of boosts self-esteem a little bit, which is all great. Um, and then on Thursday, November 11th, North will be partnering with Area Veterans Association to honor veterans at ceremony in the field house. So there's lots of exciting events happening at North to better our school and community. So I'm really excited to see where that goes and more events are to come, which is also great. As for me, a student at North, I'm staying super involved through various clubs, as I said before. And as a co-president of student council, we're very busy with just always finding new ways to engage the school. Um, also, as a senior, I actually just finished sending off my college application, so the first two months of my senior year were looking into colleges and researching, so it's finally good to kind of get that off my chest and taking a little break before scholarships, which is nice. But I'm super motivated to keep up the energy at the school. It's been great so far this year, and I just feel like I continue to meet and get to know more staff and students, so that's awesome. But thank you so much for listening, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. What's your number one choice for school? Yeah. Probably UW-Madison right yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. oh, that's one of them too. That's up there for sure. Yeah, what, what profession are you hoping for? Um, something in healthcare for sure. I know I want to work with people, but yeah, healthcare probably. Thank you. I think it's really exciting to hear how the students are. Uh, yeah. It's really great to have you guys in person. You know, well, oh, it's so nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you for all of your yeah. work and, and leadership. Um, sure. For being here. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for having me. Calista. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. I'll go right into starting to talk about our schedule here at South. Um, we went right back into FlexMod. So that was kind of new since our seniors are actually the only class right now at South that have had a full year FlexMod. Um, I think things have been going really well. Uh, we kind of switched up with the freshmen a little bit just to keep them a little bit more organized. So they're instead of scheduled into the commons, so we have like usually if you have a study hall, you go into the commons, they have assigned resources. So I think that helps, you know, keep them more organized and on top of their schoolwork. And I think it helps with upperclassmen and sophomores just to not have too much hectic kids running around. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> we have this thing that's called conflict. So it's where usually two or it could be three classes overlap. And so with that, we do have student managed resolutions. I personally took the student managed route because you know it could be dependent on if I need to take this class one day and then I'll come to another class late and just talk about it with my teachers. So <coughs> we do have that in our schedule. I think students are handling that really well. Um, our school has had a few altercations between students. I think it was on the underclassmen side, but I think overall uh, everyone's getting back into the swing of things. So I think it's going really good. Um, for the athletics, we actually have a lot of good highlights this year. Um, for homecoming, we had 700 kids, which again, with North as well, that's our biggest turnout mm -hmm. since five years. And the dance was really good. Our DJ was actually decent this time, so that was good. <laughs> yeah, so that was really good. Um, for volleyball, our um, senior, Maddie Ignacevic, was voted player of the year in the RFCC. And also our coach, Abby Sigler, earned the FRCC Coach of the Year honors, so that was really exciting. Um, we had in cross country two members, Alex Gaffin and Riley Brotts, both qualified for state and will compete this Saturday at the state meet. 
And then for South Golfing, Ava Whitstock was in the WIAA Regional and Sectional Champion and finished 17 at State out of 78 golfers. Wow. And she earned third team All-State Honors. So that's very exciting. I think athletics have been going great. I think students have that mindset of, it's been like almost a year off now, you know, let's get back into it. You know, and I personally, part of being part of cheer and then being part of like, aside from athletics, student council and red team, which red team is where we have upperclassmen kind of help around the school. We got to help with freshman orientation. I think everyone has that mindset of like, making this year a really good comeback year. So I think we all are doing really good with that. And of course, my favorite, we, we rise. Um, I sadly would like to um, state that we did lose a member. Um, Monse Cabrera, Cabrera was um, had passed away, and it was right after her press interview. Um, but she was able to be honored. Sorry, <laughs> um, <Perfect>. sorry, <laughs> um, honored in the newspaper. So. Woo! <laughs> a good dive into junior year. Um, but we've been um, keeping up with the meetings. I think our momentum has kind of shifted with that. But we've been gaining new members and <laughs> really pushing to continue her hope for that. So yeah, it's okay. You got this. I'm going into it. Um, we also have a musical, which is a combined between North and South. And it's Mamma Mia, which I absolutely love. The sets look really good. They've been working hard on that. Opening night is November 9th. No, it's not. Yeah, it's November 9th. And if you guys want to see it, you can come actually during the school day at 945. So it'd be really nice if we could get as many people there because I think it's new for a lot of our students here. And I think it'd be really good to get a good um, audience for them. And some personal observations I've had is that just overall, I think students are really able to um, come back with a, a healthier mindset. I think when it was virtual, it was a lot harder to see where everyone was at, but you know, coming back to it, I think students are having better relationships with teachers. We have a lot of new staff on the board, and they're a lot younger, so I think that kind of impacts their relationship with students. I personally have helped hire some of these staff, and they've done really good, and I think I've seen really good interactions with them, so that's really good to see <coughs> on my side. Um, We've been having a longer advisory time, so our lunch time kind of shifted. And I think that hasn't changed too much with how the usual school day is run. We go over regular announcements, and I think for upperclassmen, we're pretty much okay with that. Um, I took the ECCP um, for, you know, just prepping for usual or later tests, and I think that went really good too. Um, but I think that's good. Any questions? Sorry, I kind of ran through that. <laughs> where did you take that prep, that ECC? When did I take that? Yeah, or where did you take it? Did you take it online? No, I took it in the building. We took oh. it in just one of our gyms. Okay. And it was around last week, Wednesday. So, oh, yeah. yeah. So that's a good it was, yeah. prep for a year. Yeah. CTs and yeah, I did it sophomore year, so I it was like nicer to just have it a little bit more organized yeah. in person. And was there a fee for that? Was there a fee? Did you have um, to pay for that? Yes, we did have to pay for it. I think it was $18. Okay. And we paid for it just before. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So what are your plans after this year? Oh my goodness. <laughs> this year goes good. <laughs> um, I think I'm, I hope to get accepted into colleges of my choice and you know, go into a lot of business classes. I'm taking a class right now at the Sheboygan campus, um, business in its environment, and I love the professor, and the class is really good. So I hope to keep up with that. I think senior year, I should be focusing a lot on my early college credit program classes, because most of my credits are already taken. So do you have a profession after high school? Uh, I wanted to be I want to be a real estate agent slash investor and I want to kind of go into that I've had always had a fascination with that and I also want to take law school kind of as like a finisher and so yeah a little bit ambitious more. yeah a lot of money is like what I'm saying <laughs> 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 yeah, whatever works <laughs> yeah any other yeah. questions yeah so you mentioned there's kind of like a shift in focus with we, we ride mm -hmm. and how is it how's it growing how's the conversation progressing I know that you had a chance to meet 
local legislators at some point in the <coughs> programming and tools? Yeah, we have a meeting with Mandela Barnes again on November 9th, so I'm really excited for that. It's going to be in person, and our first meeting went amazing, and we are all really happy. So I think that's going to really push our momentum because it's kind of slowed down. I know like I have a lot of student council meetings on the days we were supposed to meet and so along with being virtual I actually had time set aside for that but I think we've split up into committees so we're trying to achieve as much as we can um, I think we might have spread ourselves a little bit too wide so we are reconvening and thinking like maybe every other week would be the best sure. but I think overall with getting new members things are gonna get more back on track and we've of course focused on education and seeing if we can reach out Again, to the sixth grade, we worked with Mr. Renzelman on that. So seeing if we can touch back based on him with the curriculum, and then we're also gonna focus more on our own district and our own school. So talking with, again, with all the staff, um, I think I remember mentioning that we did have an all staff meeting. So I wanna kind of reconvene with the staff again and just mention like, what are the changes that you're seeing after our meeting or what else can we talk about? And again, we have a really young staff. So I think just mentioning things like that is gonna be really good. Good focus for the group. Right. Other questions for Calista? No, no, thank you for all your leadership and work. It's exciting. And um, thank you both. You're, you're welcome to stay or you can go use the rest of your night for <laughs> whatever you'd like. So. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Yes, thank, thank you, you so much. much. All right, on to item number seven, which is community input. Is there anybody here tonight to care to address the board? Anyone here who cares to address the board? Ask call anyone in the room who cares to address the board. Hearing none, is there anyone online? I'm gonna check right now. Okay. There's none. Okay, all right. Uh, then we'll move on to Item number uh, number eight, which is a superintendent's report. Thank you. Good evening again. It's uh, nice to be back in our normal meeting space and location. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things. Uh, we have a local um, education paper that gets distributed across the state. Red Raider Manufacturing um, had an article and was highlighted uh, pertaining to the you know, manufacturing process in the fall edition of what we call Manufacturing Today, which is a subset of, of the um, statewide education uh, newspaper um, where they hi highlighted a variety of school districts and what they're doing around um, technical and career education, especially around manufacturing, obviously since it's called Manufacturing Today. Um, we really uh, highlighted the commitment to the flexible options for students, the career and college pathways, the extra courses that they can get both high school and college credit for, um, the ability to be able to go out and do job co-ops and work in our community, um, really this, to, to build those skills so that we can overcome a skills gap. Um, but also, um, right now the employment market, as everybody knows, is extremely competitive and extremely hot and needing uh, workers for our local industries. So I want to thank Jason Duff and all of the teachers that work in our Red Raider Manufacturing for maintaining such a quality program. Calista, me Calista excuse me, mentioned the North-South Musical, the student day where they're going to be able to see it as the ninth. The public perform performances are start on the 5th, 6th, and 7th, and then there's the following weekend, the 11th, 12th, and 13th. As Calista mentioned, it's in the South High Auditorium. You certainly can purchase tickets online at the North or South web pages. Uh, one of the things, if you've been uh, by the, uh, uh, the South Side where our house construction project is going on, uh, the walls are up. I should say three of the walls are up. Uh, the goal is to be fully enclosed, roof on, um, by Thanksgiving break so that they can start the interior work and then they'll work over the winter, but they want to have it enclosed, roof on. Uh, by Thanksgiving break, and so they're well on their way. Uh, there's only two houses in process, and SASD is the walls are up where the other house is, um, which is a Warner model, is um, just has the foundation for it. So it's very nice to see that. <clears throat> Speaking of um, uh, of uh, relocating, moving, etc., you might have saw when you came in boxes in our hallways. 
The first group uh, will be moving to the new administrative services building. That will be the superintendent's office, business services, and our um, technology, uh, information technology department. Uh, we will be moving Monday and Tuesday. Uh, two weeks later, we'll be followed by HR and community rec. And then two weeks after that, will be Jake and the SNI team. Um, so that by mid-December, we'll have all of the um, departments that are moving out on site at, at our new building. So uh, I want to thank uh, our in current uh, facilities and maintenance team, Dave Albright, and all of his team for doing the cleanup, the work, the, the minor renovations, working with the contractors as we had to install the fiber and uh, change the door locks, all of those customary things you do when you purchase a, a new building. Uh, work with the, with the town of Wilson, uh, the DNR on our wells, um, all of those processes. And then Mark's been facilitating that process and also all of the move and logistics with Georgie Miller and then all of the technology side with Wayne Eschen. So that administrative team has been working and meeting uh, regularly uh, on that. So thank you to those individuals. Um, our anticipated first board meeting out there would be in uh, early January at our first board meeting. Uh, we'll keep you posted as a board. We'll also be doing community information throughout. Um, and with that, we'll do a open house or pre-meeting where people can tour and see the building. So we're working on those plans. Um, right now, um, some logistics, uh, some of the equipment like we have in this room that we'll be putting in that room, as well as the furniture. That was one area where the furniture, we were not able to secure that furniture. Um, a lot of that things are, a lot of those items are well behind the supply chain line. Um, but we are shooting to have that meeting in January. We'll keep you updated over the next month. <clears throat> I want to congratulate uh, Ryan. Back on uh, October the 5th, Ryan and I attended the, the WASB Regional 8 meeting. And uh, as our, for the public and those in the audience, that as board members uh, attend events, uh, serve on various committees, they earn uh, various points. And there's a leveled system of celebrations, one to five, level one, two, three, four, five. And so you keep going up as your years of service and your participation. So Ryan was awarded the level four award for his uh, work, especially around the policy committee and, and, and those things. So thank you, Ryan. I appreciate all those efforts. Show for enough dinner to give you an award. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's really and, what it is. Thank you. And then a couple of community partnerships. One of the things we talk about on my goals under goal three is that internal external relationship. So we continue to meet and, and we have various teams to, this afternoon, for example. Uh, Kevin from South and Nick Collins, Mark and I met with Shoreline Metro uh, to problem solve around some of our student transportation concerns and how we use our Shoreline Metro contract. Uh, we work hand in hand with the Chamber. On Saturday, October 30th, the Chamber will be hosting their Community and Business Expo. Um, it previously has been at Blue Harbor or other venues. They're trying to get it out of the hospitality sector and into a family oriented, fun, activity to get families engaged in what are community resources and opportunities that will be taking place from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Um, right at South High one of the special treats is South then has in their clubs and activities in this case the South High culinary students uh, will actually be working selling delicious snacks uh, and be able to gain a little uh, resources for their <coughs> endeavors as well through part of that so thank you Kevin and your team for willing to host their hope is that they would trade off between north and south on an annual basis if this goes well and so again a way to utilize our community resources for our community uh, so that ends my report any questions for Todd? Right. yeah what kind of issues um, are you have are you have even having with um, with with the shoreline metro uh, this is the first that I've heard that there's been any potential uh, friction points or, or, or trouble. You know, Ryan, we, we meet regularly with people that we have and groups that we have, you know, contracts with and we work with. In this case, we did have a few student-based uh, issues. Um, obviously, you heard the, the both Sylvia and Calista mm -hmm. talking about kids are excited to be back and be with their friends and socializing. So we've had some of our students, because we do provide unlimited access to our students as part of our contract, 
unfortunately we've had some students that have taken advantage of that and we'll ride around town we'll hang out at the transfer station and so it, it's a good for us to talk about if there's problems arise let's let's address those and tackle those become before they become okay. serious issues so uh, again I think we've really pride ourselves to work with our other local agencies and governmental bodies to provide the best services for our students okay, thank you On to uh, miscellaneous item A. Before we start this agenda here, I just want to make everybody aware tonight is also our budget hearing, which is posted at 7 p.m. So, regardless of where we are in the agenda, we will stop at 7 p.m. and open up the budget hearing. If we get ahead of it, if we clear all the miscellaneous items, we'll start the reports of committees and then move back up. And if we're behind, we're going to jump down and then resume afterwards. But just be aware that at 7 p.m., we are going to scale into our budget. Budget here, but um, item nine, explaining uh, item A is our safety drill update. Which we have. Yeah, just uh, or real quick and simple, the dates of the drills, it's state mandate that we report this to you within 30 dates of the drills. Um, so this is a date that each campus held its Alice drill at school safety um, drill, and then the link at the bottom is the Google sheet where you can click in and uh, read any comments that principals left as to how the drill went, what it was, etc. But um, this is your notification as, as mandated by state law. Any questions for Jake? Hearing none, we'll move on to item B, which is the third Friday enrollment report, which is also received. Uh, with returning back to here, we are going to be presenting a few of the reports up on the screen as well as on here access on your computer. Yeah, I think the probably the easiest way for uh, to handle this is just for you to interrupt. If you have any questions, I'll go through these um, slides pretty quickly and hit on a couple that I, I think are probably more important than, than others. So third Friday, right, is our total FTEs. The way that we calculate third Friday for a student is they can either attend on third Friday or if they have to attend a day prior or a day after. So literally a kid could attend the first day of school and the last day of school and we could count them. Um, but for third Friday, uh, you know, we have to set that cutoff date. And then, um, as some of you may know, you end up, I think Mark is the one that signs off on it. We'll do addendums throughout the year if we add kids who um, were maybe truant or out um, for that period of time. So I think we added two or three already since, um, since doing this PowerPoint. So our enrollment came in at 9,592. Um, a little lower than where we were last year and we'll kind of talk through what that looks like here so it was about I had actually projected a little less than this um, our numbers overall I would say are fine um, with the exception of what what concerns me is 4k and, and kindergarten right um, those are pretty small classes and have obviously been been much larger larger in the past. Kindergarten last year was, uh, I want to say, around 550 as well. So it's hard to know, right? We can't just say we went from 550 to 618, so we added um, 68 kids. There's a whole lot of movement within those numbers, right? So our third grade maybe got <coughs> five kids, but we probably see 35 third graders move out and you know, 30 move in type thing. So there's a lot of movement within these numbers. Um, but that, th those younger ages being low, you know, that's obviously gonna set off um, a, a chain of events if that continues. And I think that's what we're seeing throughout the state. We're, we're a little better than most districts our size um, when you look at what they've done with enrollment. But um, even districts that were really growing, Sun Prairies of the world, things like that, uh, have, have put a break on some things because of, of the decline. So um, trends are, are what they are, but here you can kind of see the, the differences between 20 and 21 by um, schools. So you're not seeing much of a difference there at our high schools, North and South, holding their own. Warner's obviously up a little bit and they continue to grow as kids want that online option. Uh, our middle schools, our middle schools are down, but they're down um, 
a lot less than we thought they would. We've gone a number of years where our, we used to figure in about 20 additional kids in sixth grade. Um, we were down to three year average of really there being no difference between fifth and sixth grade. And this year we saw again a bump in sixth grade. So we were up about 20 kids more than we thought in sixth grade. We were spot on for seventh and eighth grade. The numbers are lower just because that sixth grade class is lower than the eighth grade class that, that left. So uh, that was that piece. And then our elementary schools, um, pretty normal to see them bounce within 10, 20 kids. Um, and, and they are where they are. Again, it's just that those ELC numbers are not, not the best. Um, so there's our elementary, sitting at 4,563 kids. Middle school at 1964, and then our high schools um, at 3,065. You said the largest increase we're seeing year over year is with elementary level right now, and then it's moving its way up, or is it? Yeah, you're just seeing those small classes. Yeah. Um, I mean, we've had the declining birth rates for, for years now, it's kind of catching up in school. Yeah, you, it's, I talk with a lot of districts about this, and, and the one thing that you can do is you can hire a firm to come in and give you uh, projections, right? And they've all said, the people that have used them, if you really got to do something, if you, if you have to give your board something, go do it, but good luck. Um, I wouldn't, I certainly wouldn't bet on those numbers. And it's because of the reasons you say, like everyone throws stuff against the wall. Our birth rates are down. There's nowhere to build within Sheboygan. There's tons of building going on in Cole or Sheboygan Falls open enrollment, how much they're going to take, what you're going to do with special ed. The, var the variables are just right through the roof, and then you throw COVID in there, and some people were mad that we weren't masking, some people were mad that we were. You, you, I look at every single one of those forms and the rationale that the parents give. There's, there just isn't, it's, they're all one-offs. Yeah. Um, right before I came into my role, I remember Mark Holzman we paid secretarial time extra to go through and kind of do in <coughs> exit surveys and what came from it was exactly that it was just a bunch of one-off stuff um, and no real strong themes as to where where parents were going or why it's a lot of it just works better with where I work it works better because of sports it works better for this or that um, so we can always do that we're happy to do that um, but I think we, we kind of get the general picture here um, race ethnicity about the same, um, white population up a little bit, I believe our Asian and our Hispanic population were down a touch. Third Friday enrollments for introduced lunch held steady, so that was um, nice to see. We had been on a pretty steady increase, right, 49, 54, 55, 59. Uh, we were really hoping to not see a 62, 63 percent up there, and, and, and we're not. Um, I think if you talk with our staff, poverty is probably the, the biggest barrier to education, right? Um, How are you determining the free and reduced lunches? Because aren't we providing free meals for all the kids? Yeah, but the kids still do the paperwork, um, and they still get there's direct certification, and there's a, a number of ways they. Why would they do the paperwork if they get it anyway? Um, a lot of different reasons. Title, uh, buildings get credited for essentially having those kids, so buildings really push for that paperwork to get filled out. But you could be right. Um, that, that number could be artificially low. Um, but we've had direct cert schools for three, four years now um, where they've been 100% served and, and things of that nature. But generally speaking, those principals really want that title money and AGR money. Third Friday enrollment for open enrollments, uh, you can see a net of 48 out, which is kind of gets us back to the pre-COVID levels. This is another one where um, I think, again, we could have conversation around this if this was something that we wanted to address. I think the number is threefold. One, we're losing, we're losing students to other districts. We understand that. Two, we cut. Um, enrollment of special ed students right and we did that about four or five years ago when that law changed so if if we reopen for special ed that would you know we could get that number down probably 15 20 kids uh, unfortunately we can't hire enough special ed teachers and EAs to help the students that we already have um, 
so I don't I don't think that's a wise idea uh, but it helps explain some of some of that gap uh, and then obviously mark can explain the financial part to it if, if anyone has questions about that but it isn't really a financial hit hit to our district necessarily either so um, I think we're always interested when families leave as to why but I don't know that that number is a huge huge deal to us given the, the variables within it so there's our state open enrollment in 233 coming in. You can see the sizes of the different classes and um, what that looks like. You know, it's just, you can't make, these numbers just surprise me so much this year because you look at 4K where our numbers are low, but it's our biggest class of um, open enrollment in, right? Other than what we're gonna graduate in, in 12th grade this year. So it's just doesn't make a heck of a lot of, um, sense and it just is there's just so many variables there uh, open enrollment out again didn't lose a ton in 4k I expected that number to be huge um, and wasn't so that's a that's a decent deal if you look at that you know 26 to 30 so we're at a net negative 4 for 4k um, not a pl head place to be and I think we're probably about even now because we've added some some 4kers as well and then you can see the other grades usually between 30 and, and 50. Um, this is where they go uh, and where they come from so these are the ins. Sheboygan Falls is always the biggest for us <coughs> but we draw from a number of different districts and then our out which uh, Kohler's always our, our our biggest out. I don't know if the clearings is going to help us out there at all. If, if families will stop, or if Kohler will stop accepting uh, open enrollment, there was rumors of that for a while. And That's their new subdivision, the clearings. Yeah, sorry. Um, so we'll see, but uh, we just keep plugging along there, um, and then the non-public schools. Obviously, Christian's got a new campus, and um, we figured that they would see a, a boost this year, and they did. So this is probably the slide that helps most with that. They went from 307 to 419 um, with their net at some kids. The vouchers continue to, to play a role there, and Mark can talk about that from a financial standpoint. But um, Jake, do you know out of those that did, uh, trans that, uh, those that increased from Lutheran and from Schwinn Christian, do we do we have any idea whether or not they were SASD students or SASD families that moved in, or were these families from outside the county? Yeah. Or outside, uh, on the county they they could be from family. anywhere. We're still trying to get the numbers specific to the schools, uh, okay. and I think I think we're close to having those, and I can certainly bring that back to the board at some point in time. So, Jake, could really be around those factors of it could be new kids moving into the district who then choose right. that school. It could be open enroll or coming from another district outside of us or it could be from us that would account for those differences. Yeah, yeah that 419 could be kids that live in Manitowoc. Right, no, I, no, I get it. Um, <coughs> just knowing that that was always one of, that's been one of the things that we would hear, it's like, well, I'll go to Christian or I'll go to, I'll go to a Lutheran because of, because of the masking issue. And it's just, just curious if that would, if, if you had any data that would prove or disprove that, that, uh, that's, that theory. Yeah, I mean, obviously we didn't mass this year. I think they're no. looking at yeah, uh, vouchers. Do they have anything? Yeah, to play? because yeah, and they keep raising those. Vouchers, well, you'll see in the budget mm -hmm. through the row. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. 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 And Mark will, will be able to address that in the budget presentation. Yeah. Any questions? For you? Any questions.
introduction start, needed, and I'm right? Gonna interrupt when I feel appropriate. Okay, so I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to share these results with you. As you know, um, me being new to this position, I'm going to do my best to talk through what we're seeing right now um, in, in relationship to our assessment data. Um, and we're going to compare it back to previous assessment data that we have access to. We're going to touch on why we're going to use caution on with that. But I do have to say I look forward to sharing also our um, district and our school report card from the state. Um, we're hoping for those to be released in middle of November and, and then putting that on the agenda to share out with you as well. Um, and then we're also going to share out our secondary level panorama SEL survey data. It was an optional fall window. Um, so any of our schools could participate, but our secondary took us up on that. So we'll talk through those results as well and, and um, see where our students are at as they've returned to school. Um, Let's see here. A couple of these bullet points that I've pulled are directly from our DPI, wanting us to just have an awareness of our state assessment. So um, as, as you know, our state assessment tools are meant to be a common measure of achievement across students in our state. We do see um, an impact as a result of COVID on our assessment scores, both in our district and across the state. Um, some things to consider, we were required from the state to proctor those assessments on site. So there wasn't a virtual or a, um, an option for students to take those elsewhere. They had to come into the building to take those assessments. So if they were a family that had chosen to do virtual instruction for the school year, we made arrangements with them to come in, but it was their choice to opt out. So keep that in mind. Um, and then another piece here that you're going to see pop up throughout the presentation is just kind of a cautionary tale of this data is really hard to compare to past year's data. Um, and, and somebody had asked to be real clear on, on kind of that why. So I'm just going to touch on a couple of pieces before we get into the data. Um, so recall that in 2020, the U.S. Department of Ed said that Districts did not have to administer an assessment in spring because of the closures across the country. So what's that impact? That impact looks a lot like students not having an opportunity to have that testing experience. And we know testing experiences bode well for future testing experiences. So they're not becoming familiar if they're a new third grader first taking that level of assessment um, or it's not reinforcing the this assessment that they've taken in the past. Another thing that we should think about when we're looking at the data is there has been some version variation and what I mean by that is our forward exams last year, um, they eliminated the text dependent analysis which is the long writing um, part of the assessment. So by re removing that, the assessment is not identical to past assessments that we're comparing this data to. Another thing, fewer students took the tests. Um, this probably is the factor that they want us really, really to think about when we're looking at this <coughs> assessment data because it's going to influence the validity and comparability to state test data. So the amount of students we had participate comparing, comparing to students that tested in another district when we get to that point where, when we're looking at other district data. Um, again, those reasons for why that happened, well, in-person testing only, a lot of parent choice not to send students into buildings to participate. Just an example to paint you a picture. Um, for the forward exam, there were, are 835 EL students that could have tested in third through eighth grade. 258 of them, or 30% of our students, chose not to test. So when we look at that data, it is not representative of our whole district. How was that compared to previous years? Is that still so that's a very good question. So in previous years, we talk about more like 5 to 13% on average. Um, just depending on the circumstance, but more likely we have, as a district whole, 95% of our students participa participating in assessments during a normal year. Um, another uh, piece here is, when we're looking at this, is, is the sample, in this case, the students who took the test, comparable to our whole district population? 
Um, statistically speaking, when you compare data kind of to that point, you are looking for that 90 to 95 percent participation rate um, to consider the assessment a valid representation of your district. Um, a good example again for our ACT, our economically disadvantaged students make up 63% of the students who could have tested, but only 47% of the students took the test of that group, of that subgroup. So again, just keep those pieces in mind as we're walking through this data. Um, you know, I think we've done a good job as a team to share with you what we're doing to address these, um, these significant uh, assessment concerns. As we shared in our plans last spring and in September, we're triangulating data. What that means is we're looking at multiple measures. Um, we have from our assessments, this data being one piece of that to meet our students where they're at uh, while moving forward with on grade level content instruction. So we're doing, we're doing a balancing act in classrooms where we are looking at where our students are at and intervening there while also giving them their grade level instruction to keep us moving forward. Um, we're also looking at general patterns from this data, looking for areas of greatest need to help us best direct our federal funding for recovery. And finally, our teachers are working hard creating flexible groupings in the areas of math and reading specifically, while considering the strands of the assessment data that seem weak. Um, they are using frequent checks, like the, the quizzes of, of the past, but new, new uh, versions of that to understand our students need and to move forward. So with that, we'll move on to ACT. I'm gonna jump in, Kelly, just yep. before you get, get into the numbers and just kind of give you a general understanding of, of where we are with this. So um, we, we didn't, we never want to paint a, a picture that tries to make it look like we're trying to do any fuzzy math, but what you need to understand is when you start comparing this, why it's so difficult this year is uh, participation across the state was down, right? So you have a district like MPS that is uh, tested about 50% of their kids, right? And that's 80,000 kids, so 40,000 kids didn't test. They don't get put into that state average. So the state average becomes a really difficult piece to hold yourself to because it's not the normal group of students that you compare yourself to. So we always like to say year over year, what happened in comparison to the state because the test can get scored differently every single year, right? There, that's, the, that's the one balancing act is to always say, well, yeah, whoever's scoring it can change from year to year. What they look at can change, but the difference between what we score and what the state scores um, is a pretty pretty good indicator of how we're doing. That's, that's out of whack this year. The other thing is you can look at um, district to the north of us and they they got 95 percent test participation rate and they have like 22 percent of their kids advanced proficient something like that right um, if they tested those other five they could possibly come up from 22 a little bit you know maybe a percentage if they all you know are advanced or proficient we're at 30 you know in the mid 30s depending on the test but we got 20 percent that didn't participate when we're dividing, right, when they're doing that number, they're literally taking the number of kids advanced and proficient and dividing it by the total number of kids eligible. So if the 20% of the kids that didn't take it, if, if, the, if one passed, it would help us, right? Like it's not like they all, it, it, and if they all, if it kind of stayed at the same uh, ratio of essentially advanced and proficient to basic minimal, that would push our numbers up, you know, 38, 39, 40 percent. We didn't, we didn't want to throw that up there because we don't know. Uh, and, and what we do know is some kids did online and they opted to go online for the whole year and it was about 30, 32 percent of our population and they did well online. Other kids really struggled to go online but they stayed online, they didn't do the hybrid approach. And when we look at <coughs> our tests and we can pull certain uh, groups of kids those are the th those are some of the kids that are really struggling this year so um, there's targeted you know interventions to help those kids but um, that's the difficulty of the, of the data this year okay looking at ECT we have again you're gonna see this um, just I copied and pasted it right from the dashboard that I uh, get my data from so again just for us to use caution when we're looking at this 
Um, for ACT in particular, 13.5% of our students did not participate within our district compared to the state of 11.7. When we look here, um, we do see that there was a significant drop in our ELA scores. Those are um, in relation to what the DPI considers advanced or proficient, so they chose a cut score and they utilized that information to determine the number of students proficient. So we did see a, a drop in ELA. Um, however, we did not see as significant of, of a drop in math in comparison to our, uh, in comparison to the district. You, you mentioned cut scores. Did they change? How did they, or they remain the same? They remained the same. Yeah. yeah, and we never, in past, just for, for past board members, we never really cared about the advanced or proficient part of the ELA or math. We always look at the, the scores, right? So that's, the, that's the, the, the two pieces here. The state has to put advanced or proficient because it works with their report card, but it's much more telling to look at the individual scores in each of the content areas to get a feel for where we're at. So, when, so this is the data Jake's talking about that is, is important to us to glean information from. So the drops are comparable to the state in both math and um, English. The district is slightly better, it fares slightly better in the area of reading um, as far as, again, the significance of those drops. As I said, drops across the board statewide. Um, <laughs> a larger drop in the area of science and our composite scores um, for, for those areas. So again, th this slide, advanced and proficient, they're going to be dividing right by the number of kids who t were in the population. So we're going to get dinged there a little bit. This slide, they're not doing that with the scores. You're just getting the scores for the kids who tested. The, our scores are probably a little better than they would be had we tested everyone. For the composite, they're probably a little bit worse than they would have been on the percentage of advanced or proficient. So for Aspire, it was one of the tests that we did not administer in 2020 because of the closure. So then again, they have this up here for you to read specific to that. Um, the district here, different from ACT, had 26.7% of our students opt out. So one of the things that could have attributed to that um, was the, the time frame of the assessment, possibly. Um, ACT happens earlier in the year. Um, but but tw yes, 26.7% of our students did not participate in Aspire compared to the state at 21.4. Looking at this data, the state saw a drop of 10.5. The district saw a drop of 12.4 in the area of math. For ELA, the state saw a drop of 8.5. The district saw a more significant drop of 13.7% of students that are proficient. Just as kind of a side note with Aspire, so as we've started to, or as the state has used Aspire as their ninth and 10th grade assessment, um, they have seen that it is not a strong indicator of student success beyond beyond high school. So the DPI is currently reviewing that state contract for the ninth and 10th grade assessment. Um, it, it should be shared that to address this uh, disproportionate impact of COVID-19, we are making a new tool available to all students in grades nine through 11 um, during a scheduled school day. This tool is the pre-ACT. Um, we're giving students an experience with the format of ACT along with retired ACT questions to prepare to meet the college and career readiness standards. So this is a, a shift. This is something we are doing um, as a way to make um, college, or perhaps not college, but ACT prep available in, in the test experience itself. And we're looking at some further things to do with our students um, so that they're better prepared for the ACT in the spring. This is cool just so you so you know, so back in May when we talked about this, we asked, I think, for like $50,000 uh, to be funneled in this direction, knowing that this would likely be the case. So all our freshmen, uh, sophomores, and juniors will get to take the pre-ACT this spring. It's like 15 bucks a kid. Um, and what comes from that is they keep the booklet. They get to keep the booklet, which has all the questions in it. And then they'll get returned the, the scoring, and it'll it'll tell them exactly what questions they got right and what ones they got wrong so they can go back in, they can look at the questions, they can understand it, 
they can ask their teachers. Teachers love looking at it because they understand what ACT means rather than just looking at a standard. They get to actually look at the questions. Um, and then they can obviously uh, improve upon it. So there's a really nice piece there. It tells them their projected score that's like within a 98, 99% accuracy, depending on how many years out they are. Um, and it, um, it also gives them that chance to sit down and, and take that test with a, a paper and pencil and get some of that anxiety out before they, they walk in and, and take it for real. So um, that's a nice piece that we're doing for, for our kids there. And we appreciate you allowing us to allocate funds there. For an exam, another assessment that wasn't administered in 2020. Um, for us in 2021, we had 20% of our students participate. Uh, District-wide within the state, we had 13, or they had 13% participate as a whole. For forward exams, um, we did see drops across the board in proficiency, again, in the areas of math and reading, as did the state. And those numbers, those are, they're pretty comparable between the, the state and our district drops. We did break out our elementary school results um, that, is that advanced and proficient level. Uh, if you look, again, 1819 is there for you to review next to 2021. And then we also added the STAR um, 360 assessment that we administer to our students for both math and reading. Um, this year, you might remember, we added first grade and up. So prior to that, we were, we were doing that with second grade and up. Um, but when we look at um, the student growth percentile range, we're looking for students to land in that 35 to 50 range. The state would say that that is reflecting good growth of our students. And if you look there, we see our students are landing within that range. So again, when we're looking at that triangulation of data between forward and our star scores, and for example, the elementary or Fontes and Pinnell, data, we are able to get a more clear picture of where our students are at. Looking to the middle school level, broke those out as well. And you can see similar types of things. Um, you know, I think if I were to kind of summarize, you know, I, I do understand that these results are sobering. Um, certainly, you know, our recovery requires some extraordinary effort. Um, the resources, like we spoke to, of how we're utilizing some of those today, and um, of course, we're going to have to be really innovative over the next couple years to really take in what this means and to support our students where they're at today. Questions on that part? And remember, just for new board members, that STAR SGP is is really a neat number because what it does is it takes a kid who tests in third grade and scores a 150 and it puts that student in a cohort with other kids that test within two weeks of that in third grade and also scored a 150 and then it compares that cohort across the year right so you know how they're doing compared to their um, peers so that 35 to 50 we like to see it closer to 50 than to 35 obviously um, but that's a a very concrete number as to how they're doing against their peers and allows us to understand how we're doing in comparison to districts throughout the nation. Are we good on time? Good. Going fast. Okay. Um, for the panorama survey results, just want to touch on that over 1,500 districts utilize this survey across the nation, all 50 states. Over 12 million students participate in the survey. Um, again, remember that we said our 6th through 8th and our 9th through 12th grade schools participated in this. Um, if you look at um, the data there, you will see both a percentage of the results of answering favorably um, at that middle column, and then you'll see how that information compares to the, you want to skip back one, there we go. You'll see how that district compares nationally. So you can see we have some positive results. Um, an example of a question for emotional regulation, when things go wrong for you, how calm are you able to remain? We did see an increase in a favorable response for that type of question. Or like self-management, um, 
how often did you get your work done right away instead of waiting until last minute? We hope that's an impact of being back in school, working more closely with teachers, but we did see an increase in a response rate for that one as well. So you, this is something that our schools are able to dig into and get more information about how our students are answering. Similarly, in 9th through 12th grade, um, our schools are able to look at this data, drill down to where our students are at, and then actually go into Panorama that has built-in strategies and lessons that teachers can use. The other survey, so there's, there's two surveys embedded here. The other one is student support and environment, and you can see that sixth through eighth grade is broken down by climate, sense of belonging, and teacher-student relationships. Um, positive note, our teacher-student relationships are up four. Um, placing us in the 60th to 79th percentile compared to others nationally. In 9th through 12th grade, our school climate is up four compared to, um, and then in comparison though, while we love to celebrate that growth, we still are landing in the 20th to 39th percentile for that area, so that is something that our high schools are aware of, and as you have heard from Sylvia and Calista, they're, they're excited and they're working on those kinds of things, building back that climate in their schools. I did include a slide here just about why this matters. So by knowing where our students are at, we can develop the skills um, so that these pieces can be met. So a big celebration if a student feels connected to their teacher, more likely to use the ideas from their class in their daily life. All of those pieces are celebrations that our SEL surveys help us to um, build, build that student capacity and build those connections back to school. Finally, last slide, because I know I'm, I'm over my time. Um, we did keep our raise our hand feature. It asks this specific question. Would you like to talk privately with a teacher, counselor, or other adult from your school about how you're doing or for extra support? So both at our sixth through eighth grade level and our ninth through 12th grade level, 10% of the students who participated in the survey said yes. And what that means is a school counselor or building principal was shared their name and that adult circled back with the student in a very quick manner um, and had that conversation about what kinds of supports do you need. So we want to do that for our students because it's another avenue for students to advocate for themselves. So that's why we thought it important to leave that optional question in our survey. We're gonna move to our Thank you, Kelly, and uh, for the first go-round, it's a lot of information. We'll look forward to hearing from you I'll on the well uh, <laughs> state and district report cards. So thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Jay, for your expertise as well. I just wanted to, while well, Mark's getting started, I just want to alert the board just so that you know if you were paying attention to the screen there, I was doing some things. For some reason, the, the meeting, the Zoom call online did not start the way it was supposed to start um, and so I was troubleshooting and it's finally now operational and starting so I just wanted to know but just a reminder for those people who are now logging in and for you as board members because this is our end of the month meeting it's also recorded and put out on TV 20 so that that, that we have changed that practice as well um, but just if you get some feedback somebody says well, I wasn't able to log on right away that's why we have some technical difficulties that are now resolved all right. Thank you. So uh, today we're just going to have a, a presentation of, of our budget. As you know, we do the bulk of our budget work and building in the spring. Uh, we come to the board in June so that we um, have gone through all the additions and subtractions to the budget and we pass the preliminary budget uh, in June for the start of our fiscal year on July 1st. Uh, the reason we don't officially approve uh, the budget, of course, is because we uh, don't have our pupil count um, numbers until October, and we don't have our general state aid numbers till October, and we don't have the um, equalized value of our school district uh, until October. So we wait for all those items to come <coughs> on October 15th, and then we're able to put together our tax levy and items like that. So this presentation will be, you'll see a lot of, um, about how enrollment affects revenue, how state aid affects our revenue, 
and then we'll get into some, some other items like our debt service, um, how the private school vouchers have affected our tax levy, et cetera. So again, just uh, stop me along the way if you have questions or, or you can go back to if we get to the end and you have some questions. So again, we're uh, under state imposed revenue caps and that really limits uh, the amount of revenue the district can have from two main sources, general state aid and uh, tax levy. And those revenue caps are calculated on a three year uh, resident um, enrollment average. So when Jake talks about enrollment numbers, he's talking about kids in the seats. When I talk about enrollment numbers, it's kids that live within our district, whether they go uh, open and roll out, or if they're, if they're here in our district, uh, we don't count kids that open and roll in from other districts. So our, you can see up here our Sheboygan Area School District enrollment average uh, is 9829 and then that amount is calculated by our per pupil revenue amount which is set by the state and that's ten ten thousand seven hundred ninety one dollars and again there was no increase in that amount for this uh, fiscal year uh, the state does allow for a declining enrollment exemption if your three-year average uh, is less than the previous year and since we are in a declining enrollment uh, we have that exemption again for this year. How long can you extend that exemption? So if you have the time in Roman, you know, four years in a row, is it an exemption every year? Or is it it's <coughs> always the, yeah, it's always an exemption equal to the previous three-year average. So as long as your three-year average is less than the previous three-year average, you, you, you will receive that exemption. Mark, you just want to address a little bit about what happens on the flip side as you gain students? Yeah, so... So when you gain students, um, because you had that exemption, you aren't always getting uh, the, the $10,000 for each new student you add because you're crawling out of that three-year average. So it takes a while to get out of a declining enrollment uh, exemption too. So it takes several years of adding resident students to get out of the declining enrollment. So, and we'll have a chart later that kind of shows what we've been doing the last last three years. Um, so you can see third Friday uh, student count uh, was down 72 students. Um, that's less than 1%. Our summer school though you can see really rebounded uh, this past summer. So 2021 we, we simply all we had to offer was the virtual summer school program. It took quite a hit on the FTE but it rebounded nicely. Uh, this year, so that was up uh, 33 FTE. And there's a formula the state uses based on hours, classroom hours, and then it converts that into a full-time equivalency. So we had way more than 58 kids. We had hundreds of kids in, involved in that, but um, that's just a, a full-time equivalence, equivalency uh, number. So the total FTE uh, was down 39. And then our three-year membership average was down 139 this year. And again, that's why we qualified for declining uh, enrollment exemption. The amount of revenue we get per student uh, did not change for this year. And um, at one point there's, there was some categorical state aid put into place where you were paid per student in this aid. It was not uh, part of the revenue limit formula. Uh, that's that's at 742 per student and that that has not been added to either so for this year we had zero percent um, revenue limit per student increase and in the biennial budget there'll be no increase again for uh, next year so that's going to make it extremely difficult for uh, districts around the state especially when you look at inflation um, the consumer price index increase during um, from uh, last July to this July, it was 3.68%, and it's only gone up since then. So uh, we're in a high inflation period with 0% revenue increase, very difficult. Here's just a graph showing um, our FTE uh, enrollment trend. And then this is our three-year average 
for the last three years. So uh, for next year, for 22-23, you'll see that the 2019 enrollment will come off. Uh, so in order for our revenue, our three-year average to go up, we'd have to have more than the, the 10 32 uh, next year, which would be quite a jump from our current 97-08. Uh, so general state aid is an uh, important factor in our tax levy and uh, that really is um, determined by your property value uh, per student. Um, so our equalized property value went up 3.2%. Uh, so that's the property value within our district boundaries. Um, so it did go up but uh, it was below the statewide average increase of 7%. Um, our aid, general state aid, did increase 3.6% this year. And then uh, another aid that we get is for high poverty districts. Uh, that was reduced for this year, and that one remains would remain the same for next year. That's always a two-year um, number that you get from the state. So that was decreased. And here's just a, a graph showing our equalized uh, property value. So you can see after years of declining property value, we've um, now had six years of, of increase in property value in, within the district. And then our general state aid trend. So usually you, you see when you have state aid go up for a district, their tax levy will come down. And that's generally the case, but the last couple of years, we've not seen that because of private uh, state vouchers that we have to tax for. Um, this year, we did see um, our, our levy go down, uh, even with an increase in vouchers, because the state aid increase was uh, quite a bit more than previous years. You can see about $3 million there. Uh, we're heavily uh, funded through general state aid. 73% of our funding is from state aid, 27% under the revenue cap is from local tax levy. And uh, we're more heavily state aided since our uh, property value per student is below the state average. It's important to remember that when we get, uh, as this year we got $3 million more in state aid that does not result in any more dollars to our budget. It strictly uh, reduces our property tax levy. So when we when the state sets a revenue cap for us this year was 113 million, uh, what we do is we wait and see how much state aid we're gonna receive, the 82 million, and then we levy for the balance. So increases or decreases in state aid don't result in more, result in more or less uh, money for us and that's a general misconception uh, we've even seen you know press articles written about you know district receives three million more dollars so that's not the case we receive more state aid and then we have to reduce our levy by that amount so just an important thing as you're out in the community if that question uh, comes up you can see our tax levy uh, and I've broken this out for uh, the levy that is used for the SASD budget. That was decreased by 8.6% this year. But the tax levy that is on our tax bill for private school voucher programs um, increased 28.3%. So it's almost a million dollar increase again this year that, that we will have to levy. Uh, we levy for it, that amount is taken out of our uh, equalized state aid so our yes. people saying we have to we don't have to no we We're could reduce our budget by a million yeah to, that, i guess yeah we have to pay that to the state i mean, but, I mean we're still choosing we're choosing because the law allows us to tax because that was withheld from yes. us yes yep. but we could certainly choose to cut that out of the budget in order to because that's money that's not coming into us correct I think yep. on the flip side of that, though, Mark, is what $4.3 million do we have to spare? What staff are we cutting with building? Are we shutting down? What classrooms are we combining? Well, I got $3 million in uh, post retirement benefits that would go a long way to covering that. Mm -hmm. those, are, those are funded. Um, so 
So if we didn't have post-retirement benefits, then we would be, and I, and I guess the other clarification, just for public's knowledge, mm -hmm. is that this $4 million isn't covering vouchers just within no, that's just, Sheboygan. That's just our, our students in our area. Just, yeah, so that's just, just for our students. vouchers in our area? Yeah. That's yeah. just in, in, our, in our district now. And Mark, I, don't I thought that was always taken out of the state percentage. If you want to address that, Mark, just how they calculate that. Yeah, so they they look at uh, students that come from our district boundaries, and then they take the voucher amount that they're receiving from the state, and then um, and then they allow us they they take that out of our st our state aid. They basically pull that out of there and then allow you to levy back up to where you would have been to make so you whole. Are so just kids within our district. Yeah. Yeah, so we get a listing of, of the kids that qualify for the vouchers. Currently, the way the voucher program is set up each year, they, the floor of <coughs> what a family could make has been increasing. So it started out with you had to be at the poverty, the free reduced lunch poverty level. It's currently at 300% of the poverty level. Families apply one time when they would like a voucher. At, so if they want a voucher for their student this year, they would apply for that school who's accepting vouchers. They apply, they need to submit their income verification. Once they are approved, they, there is never an income check or verification after that. Um, that's the way the state law is written. So they parents have to prove that one time. Uh, that income level of 300% poverty level will be going away. Every year it's been going up. It will then go to unlimited income uh, for the families to qualify for the voucher. That money goes then directly, is withheld from our state aid payment, and then it's redistributed to the schools here in the Sheboygan Area School District boundary of uh, kids to do that. Uh, some of our schools locally have you know, 30% of their kids are receiving vouchers, and some of it's 100% of their kids are receiving vouchers uh, to, to attend there. Uh, from a public school standpoint, I do have some concerns about some of the, the laws that apply to public schools in terms of transparency of funding, the way that we need to present budgets and documents and so forth that do not or are not applied to our voucher schools. So the voucher schools don't have to have these same types of budget discussions and the transparency of money, even though it is coming from the same property source. Uh, unfortunately, we have tried and worked with, tried to work with our legislature, legislators, also on some transparency around that dollar number. So that on our tax bill, it says the Sheboygan Area School District tax level is blank. There, it doesn't dis discriminate between what we're levying for the district versus what's being levied as a part of the voucher program. So that's a misnomer out there as well. Um, but that's the way the program works, and we are seeing this, uh, we've seen that across the state in terms of the, the, the pool of money. So the money is coming from the same pot of dollars that are all the public schools, and now all the voucher money is coming from the same pot of money uh, at the state level. Um, Seth, just two questions on that. One, is there a deadline for a parent to apply for that voucher? And two, when does it go unlimited as far as income? My understanding that it, it, it goes unlimited in a 24, 25 school year. Mm -hmm. In terms of application, there's an application process you can you, you fill out through, it's on, mm -hmm. on the DPI website. And do you process. know, is there a deadline? So let's say the day before the school starts, they decide to apply they send their child to a private school, they could still get the voucher. Correct. I believe the third Friday is the deadline to apply. It's also worth noting that if they move their child back into a public school, we don't get those dollars from Really? That particularly notorious when it comes to the, the special ed vouchers that are reduced in 2018, 2019, they get two and a half times the funding per child, but they're still not required to meet all the same IEP requirements that we are. We're still on the hook for meeting those federal mandates and then a lot of times they don't have support for those kids. So moving back to the public school and they get to keep all those dollars that were taken away from our How does that work, let's say, if it's a high school, right? So they've gone to the private school up to eighth grade 
and now the child comes to the public school for 9 through 12. But then it's just we count them as any other student and part of our, our budget process. Okay, but it's then they're out of that voucher program. Correct, correct. Okay. They can always re-enter with that, but that's just um, some concerns we have just around the state funding formula and how that how that goes. I don't want to belittle or berate the, the whole process because I believe in parent choice and uh, stability and we're very much a, a choice district. We've talked about that half, often. I just uh, uh, get concerned when the when the way that the dollars are calculated and the expectations and the rules that we need to play with are not on the same level playing field. It causes some concern and I think there's just um, not enough public knowledge just about how the program in general works in terms of uh, the accountability measures that Kelly was talking about versus the funding mechanisms and the whole and the whole everything in between. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to sidetrack, I guess, Mark, your budget mm -hmm. presentation for us, but that's just a, a point of view regarding the private school tax levy. Well, I think it's important just because there is no transparency on the tax bill, and that's that's kind of why I include it on here because I think people need to understand that that you know our, our tax levy this year fortunately is going down the overall tax levy you'll see there's going down 5.3 percent but we've had years where our le our levy for what our budget has gone down but we've had to uh, have a tax levy bill go out with an increase mm -hmm. but yet there's nothing on that bill that explains Shows. that part of that is not for our budget so just to get a better understanding of this number though the four million dollars for the voucher program what roughly is that per pupil what's that amount per pupil they're getting Which roughly I think it's like eight thousand something now per pupil it's a little slightly different for high school okay. than uh, so it is less elementary per, it is less per pupil than what that we're getting in our ten thousand but also services such as transportation that we're required to provide, special education services we're providing, uh, and uh, access to the dollars that are like our Title I dollars, our EL stuff, that those private schools who are in the voucher program get all those services that all come through us without additional dollars coming to us. So there, there is a difference in the dollar amount, but the services they're getting, we're paying for many services. So in essence, though, we're still at least retaining the $3,000 difference for those kids being counted within our district boundary? No, we don't get to count those kids. We only count them if they open and roll to another public okay. school. So we're, so, there's, so nobody's getting that amount from the state? For no. Okay. We're putting the whole bill on. And there are special ed vouchers now, too. So they get additional money for yeah, special ed kids, depending on the level of that. <coughs> And then the last thing on that slide is just our mill rate. So that's our tax levy per $1,000 of property value. And uh, that is a 74 cent uh, decrease, which is good. Um, and that's a result of our levy being uh, reduced and the property value in, within the district right now. So it's kind of a combination of those so uh, here's our levy history broken down <coughs> by our uh, different funds that we levy for so we levy for our uh, general education fund and then you can see the private school uh, vouchers levy and you see how that's really grown back when that was introduced in 1617 our general fund levy was 27 million private school was less than half a million and now it's over four million for private schools and uh, 22 million for our general fund. Uh, we also levy for our, our debt service. You'll see that that increased uh, quite a bit that this year. That's because um, we've had a reduction in our OPEB um, expenses in our general fund, and now we're using that money this year and next year to pay off uh, the OPEB borrow that we did. So both uh, uh, that debt service that was for the, the uh, OPEP, that was non-referendum debt, which counts under your revenue cap. So, um, so you'll see a decrease in our general fund expense, but an increase now in our debt service fund. Uh, capital expansion, we had no increase uh, this year for that. 
Um, again, our goal is to get that to $2 million because that's uh, what we need every year to keep our, our buildings uh, repaired and maintained. Uh, community uh, service, recreation fund, no change to that levy. And then you'll see our total tax levy again down 5.3%. Uh, again, here we're just comparing um, the, the levy used for the SASD budget compared to private school vouchers. So you can see our, our uh, SASD levy has uh, decreased uh, narrowly the, the previous four years quite a bit this year. But you can see how, again, how that private voucher uh, levy has, has increased dramatically over that same time period. Um, here's our tax uh, levy trend over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, again, the drop, the big drop this year was due mostly to the increase in general state aid. Here's our mill rate trend over the last 10 years. See the property values within the district have uh, gone up, or our mill rates decreased. So, Mark, with the zero increase in state aid, do you anticipate that that share of property taxes and the revenue levies increase in the coming years? Uh, well, general state aid. Um, it's flat the, the, year over year. Yeah. So yeah. So, are we expecting that to increase? our tax levy as a result to make up the loss revenue? It, it depends on what how our equalized value compares to the rest of the state next year, whether that general state aid will go up or not. So it's hard to tell right now. I, um, I was a little surprised with all the, the construction you see that we were below the state average this year, because last year we, we were up like 9%. Yeah. Um, so it's slowed down a little bit now, so it'll be interesting to see, see where our, our the property values go next year. Here's just a summary again of all our different funds uh, that we have. You'll see the total budget number up there that um, you will be passing the total levy amount and the total budget amount in um, item K in the, in the agenda here. So you can see uh, special project funds, that's a lot of our uh, like donation funds things like that there's no levy for that fund and then our food service fund there's no levy for that it's self-sufficient and then the next couple of slides are just uh, a copy of the uh, budget adoption sheet that um, will show how the how you would adopt the budget for next year Expenses uh, by function, so that's basically what what uh, purpose the funds are, are uh, allocated for. 58% uh, instruction, 31% support, and 11% non-program transactions. That's things like uh, open enrollment and some of those other expenses. And then expense budget by object, that's what we're spending it on. You'll see the bulk of our expenses are uh, <coughs> salaries and benefits. Purchase services is next, and then a little bit for supplies and equipment, and then uh, the one percent is other and like our liability property insurance. Uh, some of the highlights from the budget that we uh, passed uh, back in June. Um, so we were maintaining eleven uh, teacher positions. Uh, using the ESSER II grant funds. Uh, and these positions, again, helped lower our class size this year and kind of helped with some of the, our remediation efforts uh, needed uh, due to the pandemic. We also added three additional virtual elementary teachers uh, using those ESSER II grants. And then one of the reasons why we were able to balance this budget with no increase in per pupil uh, revenue from the state was that we had no medical insurance premium increase uh, for, for 2022. So um, as a lot of districts struggle with anywhere from you know 7 to 15% medical premium increases, that's a big portion of their budget. So for us to be able to hold steady on that is a, is a big plus for us. And that's a result of being self-funded 
and having a very robust wellness uh, program here and our, certainly our employees buy into that and um, we have a great program again it's a model across the state that uh, people try to follow what we've done here and uh, we're pretty excited that we can go with a zero percent for 2022 and we're really an outlier across yeah the other state. other and some districts you know they are they don't have the enough employees to be self-funded so it's very hard for them but even some bigger districts that are self-funded have not seen um, the, these low premium increases because um, I, th I think they just don't have the robust wellness uh, program or the buy-in to, to get people involved. So yeah. we're very fortunate here. Some of the 26, 23, you know, 32% renewal premium increase. Yeah. Great. And it, it could very well be that depending on what the expenses are and depending on how many people sign up for a high deductible health plan, um, those those premiums could actually decrease yeah. next year if, yeah. if you have enough people signing up for the HDH. Right. And it's important to know it's a it's no premium increase, and that's with the same plan. We haven't right. we haven't changed the plan, so that because that's what districts do. They're hit with a twenty percent premium increase, so they they change the plan to get the you know so the the employees aren't getting uh, as nice of a plan. So um, so for salary increases, uh, the these are all. Uh, group increases, so we take, uh, like for teachers, for example, uh, teachers lower in the uh, pay scale get a higher percent raise than those at the top, but overall for the groups, the teacher group was a 2% increase, the administrative group was a 2% increase, and the support group uh, was a 3.16% uh, increase. And then the total education fund budget from last year's budget was an increase of 1.9%. Some of that was due to the ESSER funds that were made available for us. Uh, district debt service, so we currently have seven bonds. Uh, they're scheduled through 2037. Uh, there's 42.4 million remaining in long-term uh, debt. Uh, so state statute allows for debt up to 10% of your the equalized value of your district. So um, you can see that we're using uh, 40, our debt service is at 42.4 million, uh, but the total capacity is 430. So just using uh, about 10% of our debt capacity, which um, you would never want to get close to. <laughs> to that number, but just shows what uh, that our debt service is is, is um, at a medium or low compared to other districts in the state. And then our Moody's rating is double uh, A2, which is a very good rating. So just the last slide here, some key points. Um, again, the state budget includes no per student revenue increases for both this year and next year. Our state aid was increased by 3.6%. Uh, that doesn't increase the amount of revenue we have, but it does decrease the amount of, of tax levy. So our tax levy is decreasing over 5%. Mill rate is decreasing. Um, and then the 4.3 million of the levy is used for the private school voucher. 28% increase from last year. And then just some of the enrollment numbers from the voucher program. Last year, uh, the program, these were our local uh, private schools that are in the voucher program. They had enrollment of, uh, total enrollment of 1234 with 40% uh, of those students receiving vouchers. Uh, this year, that private school enrollment is up 139 uh, students with 113 more students receiving vouchers. So. That means that 44% of those attending uh, private schools are on the voucher program. Do we know that if, if those students that received the voucher, do they still have to pay any additional tuition? Do you know? No. So I mean, so they, so somebody that would get a yeah. voucher, they, it's just. Yeah, like I, I know from Lutheran High, the the voucher amount is higher than their tuition amount. So. so. Also not 
other questions uh, regarding the budget? I know they struggle a lot more with with their budget, mainly because of their uh, premium, health premium increases is a big factor. Um, so it's we've heard from other, at least from local superintendents here, what a struggle it's going to be next year. A lot of them have used all their their COVID funds this year, and they've used some of those funds for ongoing costs. So now they. They have to cover that next year if it's an ongoing cost. Um, I don't know how they're going to do step increases, salary increase with zero dollars added to the revenue. It's going to be very difficult. I think you guys have always done a great job in looking at what's best for our community and our taxpayers. And even when you're throwing a curveball like the vouchers and, and that amount, um, figure out what's what's best for our district, like buying building we thought that came out of the blue we thought it was going to be you know closer to 10 million and it was 2 million and all furnished and we can bring classes back into this building which you know gets them all together I, I, I think you're just really smart when you're looking at making financial investments for um, our community and our district and I just wish there was a billboard we could take out all over the city and say all the great things um, that you know this is a business and um, you've done a I think this this board has always been uh, very fiscally responsible. So, it, you know, a lot of the the things that we're experiencing now are decisions previous boards have made, and that's what I always try to. You know, I think this board has always done a good job. Like, like what's not best for us today, but what's best for the next people see that are on the table. So they, um, I think, the, the board is uh, responsible for a lot of that. Communities definitely has benefited from that. Other questions from the board, Mark? Hearing none, we do have a public hearing specific for the budget. Is there anyone in the room who cares to give public input on the budget? I think, I don't know if you know Seth, but I, I know the, the state, the uh, DPI website has a whole section on the application process, and that'd probably be best just to get that information directly from, that. from them. Yeah. Because I thought um, there was But two schools themselves may only open up so many oh. voucher seats, too. That's possible, you know, sure. based on their classroom size or teachers that they have. So. Sure, sure. So does, is, is the the total amount that's allowed the same across the board then? Like, do you know what I'm saying? Or is Number it of students or the dollar amount? The dollar amount. Or, yes. It's, or yeah, it it's slightly different for high school age, but, school but statewide, age. it's in the Wisconsin State Voucher Program is the same for each school. And it's just, amount. to clarify, like the, so the, the total amount, those dollars follow the children. So if, Lincoln Urban was supposed to get 
$10,000 allotted for this one student, and then that child gets accepted into a different school in the district, but school choice, yeah. that money just follows that student to the different yeah, school. Yeah, it's not the same dollar amount, but you're correct that it, you know we wouldn't be able to count that student, so we wouldn't get any funding for that student, but then the state would, would fund the, uh, the voucher amount. Just, so it's essentially still, no matter what school the student goes to, that money would have been theirs anyway. It's just following them to a different school. That's yeah. not necessarily public. Right. Okay. <clears throat> we'll close the public hearing on the budget, and uh, just for the sake of consistency, we're going to move to item A now. Um, and I'm seeking a motion to approve the 2021-2022 uh, original budget in the amount of uh, $156,353,461.70 and certification of the property tax levy in the amount of $35,543,622. So moved. Second. We've seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. All right. We'll move back up to. Thank you, Mark. Yep. 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 Thank you, team. Thank you. Uh, miscellaneous item D. So D, E, and F are all first readings. We can lump these together and take them one by one. Is there a preference from. Together. Anybody would like to pull apart? Just. Okay. I've just got a question, but I think it's. it's it, 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 it addresses, it's addressed in all three of the uh, of, of what I think. So, um, throughout the the updates in, in these policies, um, we talk about needing to get the the express written consent. Makes, I also want to say National Football League, but um, the express written consent of the district administrator um, when it comes to using school names, school logos, logos, mascots, and whatnot. Um, how would that work if somebody is renting a facility, like say a driver's ed school, and they want to say we are meeting at North Sheboygan North High School? Does that mean that you have to then sign off on every contract, say it's okay for you to say we're meeting at Sheboygan North? When we use our rec department process mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. go through and request the mm -hmm. use of and pay that dollars, mm -hmm. as part of that paperwork process, it does contain information about what they can and cannot do mm -hmm. while out there what that's really getting at especially with this affiliate group it's really when they put out their flyers or mm -hmm. put out their advertisement saying this is done at the Sheboygan area school okay. district and they throw our logo on or make it appear as if it's a school district sponsored so we'll rent mm -hmm. um, facilities to different groups in this case that we may not it, we, we're fine renting it, it, it's fine, but it's not a program of the SASD, mm -hmm. and that's what this is really preventing, is that people are, you know, misrepresenting, if you will, or the potential to misrepresent that the district is sponsoring the activity. Okay, so to, to then address like a little bit more controversial position, something like um, meet at the poll, you know, the, um, you know, the National Day of Prayer gathering at, at schools, um, they would say that they have that they're having an event at again at North High School. Yeah. Would that be would that require you to sign off on that? No. I, I, I'm looking at eight eight zero zero religious I, It's just one one word choice thing in here, but it bothers me because I think we need to come up with something more inclusive. If you go down uh, at the end of that second sentence it says under the first and 14th amendment to the constitution this remains the inviolate promise of the individual and the church of his or her choice i would i would just like to make the point that we have families and students who don't attend church but they have religious observations in a synagogue or a temple or a mosque and i think the wording on that needs to be changed to include all of our students which paragraph is that supposed to be? It's under that first, the first real paragraph under 880, 8800. Oh, 
It's at the end of the second sentence. Oh, okay, under the first and fourteenth. Where it just says that the church of his or her choice. I, that doesn't include all our kids. As the parent of two Jewish kids, and I it thought just kind of worship jumps up on how they were. What? Yeah, I thought some of our other policies even said place of worship. You know, we have we have students who are, you know, variety mm -hmm. of different religions and have different houses of worship, and we should put them in the statement. And also those that don't believe in any, you know, but you know they. They, they have the, the ability to, you know, to express their non-belief as well. I, I don't know how to change it, but I think it should be adjusted. Well, one of the things we can do is uh, if you don't need to take action, if you don't want to, on this specific policy, we can bring back a amended version with a new, different language and, and uh, look at what are some other word choices and, and options to consider and consult that way. That's probably the easiest way. Sure. I'd, uh, I'd rather get some revised language, everybody's on the same page as opposed to trying to wordsmith it now. Mm -hmm. I'd rather sure. just come back with a revised. This isn't the policy that we we need to make sure that we're implementing because, you know, from the standpoint of we have a policy in place, what we're asking for is some revision, so why don't I bring it back next month for change if that's acceptable to, to use it for. Or do we want to move to first reading and then just, you know, have it up for, for the second reading at the next time? I think I'd rather come back, Ryan, if it's up to you. It, it, yeah. My purpose would be rather come back no, and just approving just it and then having a different language change the second time around and mm -hmm. just to track that. I think okay. I'd rather come back with a revised. That works for me, too. Appreciate, we'll, we'll, appreciate we'll, we'll, that. We'll close item B. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking a motion to approve item E and F. Move approval for the move first, move, move first reading, sorry. I move, is there a second? Second. Move and seconded. Any further discussion? I'm going to suggest E and F D we're going to bring back. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. Um, we're now on to our second reading, which is item G, H, and I. And I'll put together. I'm seeking a motion to approve the second reading, so item G, H, and I. Move approval. Moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carried. On to item 10, which is report of committee. First up is curriculum and instruction, uh, which is myself. So we had our summer school report. Um, as was noted uh, earlier, we had quite a bit of a rebound in summer school this past year. Um, the students were excited and engaged. It was an overall, um, overall successful, successful year. Got a presentation on um, AODA grant project and some work that's going on in schools as well as our class size report. All of that's for information and discussion. I um, encourage you to read the minutes if you would like more information. Uh, B is the Human Resources Committee with uh, Mark Manson. Uh, it was pretty vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> and move approval of uh, item number one, appointments. Item number two, leave of absence. And item number four, uh, the retirements that were listed. Is there a second? Second. Seconded. Any further discussion? <coughs> in favor, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. And also uh, move to approve the uh, district calendar for the 22 23 school year. Second. Seconded. Any further discussion? Three now. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Okay. On to uh, facilities, recreation, and theater with Ryan. I've never been so excited to see one of David's slideshows uh, in, in a very long time. It was good to see him back. Um, that was really the main the main item on the agenda. It was kind of giving an update as far as what we're doing with um, with the uh, salt, you know, the, the salt shed, the work, the work shed, um, some of the upgrades in sidewalks and uh, and roads around Horace Man. Um, and also some of the uh, some of the renovations that are going on at the administrative services center. Um, that was really the, the bulk of the discussion. Um, I did have a chance to speak with John Kaler uh, the other day. Um, John is, is not, was not able to make it today due to um, due to some health issues. Um, and he wanted me just to let you guys know that they are moved. They're getting close to um, interviewing and hiring. Uh, people to uh, for the uh, Sheboygan Recreation, uh, 
the, the SGC should want a theater company position and also um, for the replacement of Fort Jefferson Sally as well. So they're, they're moving on with that and hopefully we'll have some information by this time next month. And that's it. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, on to finance and budget with Mark and Chair. Right. You know, uh, the items number one through four were all waiting for our audit to be completed. So once that all is done, we will uh, have updates on that. I would encourage everyone to, because uh, I don't have it at my fingertips, but the fund balance designation, there was a presentation of uh, what the fund balance designation is going to look like. <coughs> if you don't, uh, for the, it's the undesignated funds, and we, I think we're at about 25 million right now, Mark. Yeah. And we we try to keep that down to what about 18 or uh, 18 to 20 percent. Yeah, it's fifth, uh, board policy says 15 to 20 percent. We were at 18.5 last yeah. year. So we've got some money to spend down, and uh, there was a nice presentation and executive summary of what's been identified as uh, major items uh, that's been on the capital fund. So please go back and take a look at that attachment from the uh, finance committee, because I just don't have it at my fingertips here to discuss, uh, and it's good good notes on there, but you're not getting an idea of what's being presented, in it, and we will. It will be presented to uh, the Finance Committee again in November, and then it will be moved on to full board approval. Yeah. But uh, to be prepared for that, to look at those items, to give any input, would be wise to, to do. It's all, it's all good stuff, uh, updates to athletic fields and things like that. And the, our practice the past several years has been to bring that to finance twice. So we bring the recommendations. And then we listened to uh, the input from the committee, and then uh, the administrative team takes that input and makes any tweaks we feel are a result of those uh, remarks. And then we come back a second time for the committee to take well, I action. Think there were some upgrades too, for to like fiber optics and things like that. Yeah. Where's the easiest place to find that one? Did you just go back to the committee meetings night? From last month? Last, yeah. Or two uh, weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Okay, and then there will be an executive summary on our, uh, the finance committee that was an attachment. Thank you. And if any board members who do not sit on finance want to um, give suggestions or thoughts or have questions, you can bring them to myself and Mark, since we chair and co chair. But it is kind of a big deal. There's some, you know, we're talking about significant amounts of money, so I just wanted people to be prepared and not. Not be surprised. Not be surprised, or, or if there is something else that we would like to see tweaked on that, to give us the feedback. So something like the Mark Mansell baseball field that's going to be on there. That, I just want lights. Okay. <laughs> 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 name the lights after me. <laughs> well, it's ridiculous that the city has one place to play baseball in the dark. Mm -hmm. So that, that's it for item number five. Item number six of gifts. We have one gift that needs approval, and that was uh, $2,500 from Sargento to the Sheboygan Theater Company. So I move approval of that. Second. Moving seconded. Discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor, Scott? Aye. 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 Motion carried. Nothing to report for the committee as a whole. On the special board committee assignments, we have our legislative breakfast. I know that Ryan, uh, Seth, and Mark were able to attend. Well, um, it was very much a continuation of what happened last month, though. A lot is it's still some continued discussion about um, uh, about CRT, uh, but more importantly, the whole idea of transparency. You know, Seth had mentioned earlier when we were talking about vouchers and transparency. It was it was brought up to our legislators that that um, those that are in voucher schools don't have the same reporting requirements that we do in in, in the SASD. For a number of different a number of different items, um, and uh, you know, in talking about transparency uh, of our state legislators, like what are you doing when in, in regards to education? Um, when it comes to education bills, um, you know, that was brought up about um, the assembly bill that equitable banned CRT, our critical race theory, and and our legislators were asked 
the day before the vote, we're, we're going to stand on it. And one of the legislators said, well, I have, I have thousands of bills, I haven't read them. Uh, and then that very day, that next day when the vote happened, that all of a sudden, you know, he had a fairly lengthy press release, you know, supporting the bill. Um, and that was mentioned in saying, you know, if, you, if, we, if we're really going to work together, let us know, you know, give us an honest assessment. You're in favor of it, let us know so we can have a discussion. If you're against it, let us know so we can have a, an honest discussion. And the response from our legislators was disheartening. Um, one legislator said, well, we're just going to have options. Well, why don't we just have options for everybody, which was not really about what the topic was. Um, and, um, and the other two legislators didn't say boo. And, um, yeah, and it's, it's frustrating um, when, when you really are trying to come to a common, a common ground. Um, and you have, you know, I have a party, and I, I'm not talking political party, I'm talking just one organization that has made it clear that they said that our opinions are valued, but when we ask for their opinions, for their opinions, it's, we don't, we don't get much of a response. And that's, that, does, that doesn't help us in trying to plan, and I don't think it helps them either. But that's, that's my own personal opinion. I don't know where you are with that set. That that was a it's a it, and Mark it does a fairly fair fair read uh, of what happened during the meeting. But that's that's just my own personal opinion. Uh, the the bulk of the meeting, as you discussed, Ryan, was around AB four eleven, which was it's been pegged as the critical race theory bill, and mm -hmm. it's 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 that's not the concern from our, from our mm -hmm. standpoint of our county school districts and on our school district and the fact that. We, we're not teaching critical race theory. The concern was the author of the bill uh, put in some terms that would make it in concepts that we would not be able to discuss in school, which I think are critical uh, for uh, our community, for the, the words inclusion around our special ed community, around um, any number of community members. That's a term and a concept we would not be able to teach if that bill would become law. Equity was not a word or a concept we'd be able to talk or teach about. Social emotional learning. We just heard a presentation about self regulation, <coughs> mental health, but the word social emotional learning is attached to that bill. And so the concern is there's some words there that just aren't aren't in line with what critical race theory is. We're not here to talk about critical race theory from a standpoint of saying we're we're not teaching critical race theory, but there are many concepts that we're teaching that are, are necessary that we need to, to talk about that we currently weren't able to do. I don't know what it would do to our special education and our, and our um, English language learners in terms of saying we, the word inclusion isn't a word that we can utilize. So those are some of the conversations we were trying to have. Our legislators admitted that they did not see that testimony from, from the author, that they did not understand that. Um, right now we were told that that bill in assembly it did pass. Um, uh, Senator Lemahieu said it's not gonna be up for vote anytime soon in the, in the Senate. Uh, took that as, as, a, as a good news. Um, but again, was, as, as Ryan said, I think that we're disheartening trying to engage in a conversation. Help us understand what the concerns are, and we can help educate you as well as what we are or aren't doing in our schools from a mm -hmm. from the Sheboygan mm -hmm. County. And that's the piece that we've kind of lost. So we're, we're really trying to be condescent uh, as superintendents and, and others that attend. There's board members like Ryan and, and their uh, board member from Keele attends on a regular basis. Just saying, let's have some honest, open dialogue, and I, I don't expect that um, they're going to hand up from every mm -hmm. different group, whether it's medical, law enforcement, mm -hmm. business, whatever. They're not going to stand top of every bill, but when we meet once a month, let's really talk about issues around education mm -hmm. and how do we work collaboratively to ensure that we've got the best education system in Wisconsin yeah, right. and, and across. So that's that's really the point of it. Um, so we'll, we'll see what the next month brings. Uh, or back at the table in a couple weeks. Um, I just want some clarification. So yeah. when you're talking about the word inclusion, how is that word going to change special ed students? Like how, how does that affect them that you're using a different word? Because like, I don't know when it changed because it was always equality in education and then it changed to equity. Equality is also on a list that we would not be able to use. 
So. There's what, 70 Yeah, words. but I, I mean, if you change the wording, then how is that going to, I mean, I mean what words you can use? So here, here's an example of, of when we talk about the word inclusive, and we talk about how do we include others and be mm -hmm. inclusive, that we can, how do we include others just in a, in a, in a sense of we're in a class, we're in a, in a gym class, we're in a choral class. Let's talk about inclusive. Let's make sure that we're including everybody. That notion and understanding of what that means to include everybody, regardless of their gender, regardless of their age, re that concept in and of itself would be prohibited from us to be teaching kids and working through that in a school setting. That's what that law would, would do if that would become law. And also, too, there are some federal grants and programs that specifically use those words, you know, inclusion, um, you know, restorative justice, which is, a lot of it is, having worked in restorative justice, is you broke a window, you pay, you pay for the window that you broke, and you talk to the guy whose window you broke, you know, um, and it's, it's those kinds of things that are, that are that are concerning. Um, certainly, I understand the other the other point of view, um, you know, personally. But but it's it's more it, it is tied into funding. It is also um, it's it, it does hamstring the language, which you know which can really make things make things difficult. Um, yeah, so that's at least that's that's how I see it. Um, you know, it's it's not trying to get into an argument about. Or where we stand on this, I think that argument may be coming later, but not tonight. It's more, it's, it's, it's some of it is tied into funding. Has there been any discussion with them? And I know maybe this is a topic for WASB too. Yeah. As far as looking at the uh, requirements for becoming a bus, a school bus driver, because right now, with my understanding, is you have to get a full blown CDL. And if there's such a shortage of this, why aren't we talking to our legislatures to say, let's just get a straight up school bus driver driver's license? I think that's the way it used to be. Yeah. And, so. and we could maybe address that shortage. And I mean, I, to me, that's something that should be brought up at this legislative breakfast. Yeah. And, yeah. and or with WASB. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to spearhead I'm not quite that ambitious about it. But <laughs> but that, well, uh, you, don't, you don't want it? You don't want, you want an award? Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, two things, I'll turn, over to, I'll turn over to Mark. Yeah. But, but we did, the, the meeting prior, we did spend the bulk of the time talking about uh, staffing shortages. We talked about um, the East Coast, some of the states in the East Coast, that they use the National Guard to provide some immediate relief. Um, some of those processes, I know Mark, the Bus Association and others have lobbied really yeah. hard to get that changed. Yeah. I, it really is uh, a federal. I just haven't heard that brought up with yeah. in, yeah. in this there, room before. It's there, just like, it just seems like it should be yeah. automatic. I mean, there are federal requirements, so our, our local legislators, other than uh, um, growth men, yeah. really have no say so in that. But um, I know our uh, visit at uh, WASBO. Um, the School Bus Association, they have all lobbied for several years to change that. So, um, you know, I don't know how bad it has to get before someone understands there's a much, there's a simple solution to that. Yeah. So we'll continue to do that and um, reach out to, to Grothman. And it and, dawned uh, on me that it was a federal regulation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and I think WASB has, but I'll, I'll double check, I'll get back with you on it. Um, just no, it's good. Oh, <laughs> so, I think I think Ryan and I covered this topic in depth about what this month was about, and we'll update you on next month on next month's meeting. Thank you. Uh, Citizens Facility Advisory Committee, Mark. So the committee met uh, last week Monday over at Longfellow Elementary. We did not have a quorum of voting members there, so we didn't take action. Uh, I think the only thing was approving the minutes from the previous uh, meeting. So we'll approve those at the next next meeting in November. Um, what we, we met there just to tour uh, Longfellow. So one of, again, one of the uh, options that was presented to the committee was to um, kind of add on to Longfellow and, and make that a middle school. So we took a tour to show all the things that you know could work or might not work if that you know within that option. And um, next 
month uh, when we meet, uh, we'll be concentrating on how each of those different options for the two middle schools best meet the criteria that was set forth by the board and uh, that criteria, the committee has already weighted that criteria, so which of those are more important compared to each other. And now we're gonna go through e each piece of criteria and, and decide which options best meet those. So I'm guessing that'll take several meetings, but then after that, we're hoping we can uh, come back to the, they can come back to the board with some recommendation. Very good. Uh, the, the, um, the minutes are there for you to read. Just uh, I know you received this week an all in for education for the November 5th um, event. Um, that's their big fundraiser for the year. And uh, we've had some past board members that have done really well. Um, so it's, uh, it's a good time. It's, the location has changed. That was at the Bowl for many, many years. It's at Pine Hills. So a new location. Um, they've got always great raffle prizes and uh, winners and losers prizes, if you will, called the Loser Lounge, yeah. or Second Chance, I should say. <laughs> uh, but they also have a silent auction that a lot of people uh, will bid on items that could be used for uh, maybe an upcoming holiday gift or birthday or special anniversary. And always, always some unique baskets, if you will, that are put together. So good times always had by all. Um, so if you haven't, and if you haven't bought a raffle ticket or if you know somebody needs some, I have some raffle tickets. It's a, it's an autographed Bucks jersey. It's a grand prize. Very good. Communications are with there for your information. Future meetings, we are back to the whole on the 9th, and then on the 23rd, we did a shy turkey day. We're at our Metro Board of Education here at Truly Spirit. With that, I am looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, Jack. Aye. We are adjourned.